This is part two of the, our Bible study together, the for sure real conspiracy. There are lots of conspiracy theories out there, and we talked a little about that last time, but a conspiracy theory is just that. It's a theory. Last time we looked at what the Bible says about the actual conspiracy that's going on between the devil and his confederates, and the true and living God of heaven, His only begotten Son, and all the holy angels, and there was somebody else involved in this thing. Who was it? We talked about this last week. Anybody know who it is that's involved in this great conflict? It's us. That's right. So, how important is this? to us if we're involved in the fray, in the battle. According to the Bible, is there a conspiracy to overthrow the kingdom of God? Absolutely there is. Is there a war going on right now to try and do this? Yes, there is. And folks, I believe I truly believe that this is one of the most important things you can learn about the Bible in these last days. It is of the utmost importance. And so I want to go back to the Bible and approach this part two from another perspective, the Bible itself. Have you read a good book lately? You know, that's almost a salutation in the world in which we live, or at least it used to be. I don't know that so many books get read uh, these days as they used to. But you would hear one person say to another, have you read a good book lately? And I hope the answer is yes from each and every one of you. Because we should be reading our Bibles every day, shouldn't we? But the reason I ask the question is this. When you read any book, are the first few pages really important? Any book you read, you know, it's just part of the process that in the first few pages the author is going to tell you what it is you're going to be talking about and what it is you expect to get from that. And don't misunderstand me because I think every page of the Bible is really, really important. But I want to do a simple study with you as we begin today by just considering what the Bible has to say in its opening pages. And by the way, in any book, the last few pages are really important too, right? Is the book of Revelation important? Yeah. Ties all together. Ties everything together and, and kind of wraps it up is what they say. Well, here... In the very first words of the Bible, Genesis 1.1, what does it say? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And folks, the first two chapters of the Bible are all about the creation story, which is a major reason why we're supposed to worship God, according to the Bible. Because He is our Creator, right? So, the very first story in the Bible, two chapters, is the creation story. And it's just, you cannot say how important that story is um, to, the, to the book at large. It's the foundation, right? The very first chapter is the foundation. So chapter 3 is about the fall of man and his eviction from the Garden of Eden. Think about it. Would the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and what happened with the fall of man, would that have something to do with the conspiracy that we're talking about? I mean, is it, is it on point? Is it on subject? Did the story of Adam and Eve's fall have something to do with this rebellion and Satan trying to usurp God's authority, his power, his throne, the worship that alone is due to him? 
The fall of man is a very big part of this story of rebellion and overthrow of a government that we're talking about. Disrupting God's plans for planet Earth. Chapter 4. It's all about Cain and Abel. You know the story, right? Both of them were worshiping God. So is this just a family story or is this a religious story? Is it a religion story? You know, Cain and Abel was the first religious war ever fought on planet Earth. God gave them implicit instructions on how to, to worship Him. One did exactly what God said. The other one tried to pick his own way. Did the one that did God's way get mad at the other one? It's vice versa. So you really have this microcosm of God's true church and this other church that's trying to go in a different way. And who is it that persecutes the other? Yeah, it's the unfaithful church that persecutes the faithful church. Are God's faithful people ever involved in persecuting other Christians? No, no, no. Absolutely not. And I think that's of the utmost importance. It's a hard lesson to learn, and it's a lesson that so many times has not been learned. But folks, if you are manipulating, forcing, persecuting, and killing somebody else. Who's your God? Which one is your church? That's really, really important. That's chapter 4. Chapter 5 is a genealogy, and it tells us the first generations of men that walked on the earth after God's creation. That's important information. Then chapter 6 through 9 tell the story about Noah and the flood. What is that story about? It's all about disobedience, isn't it? Do you think that fits into what we have been talking about here with the conspiracy, the rebellion, the overthrow of God's government? It's so obvious isn't it? It really is another pointed story about Satan's influence and rebellion here on planet Earth. Then, because people came off the ark and had to start all over, chapter 10 is another book of genealogies. It tells us the first generations of men that walked on the Earth after the flood. Kind of a new beginning for planet Earth. And so that's the first ten chapters of the Bible. Chapter 11 is the story that most people refer to as the story about the Tower of Babel or Babel. It's the story I really want to focus on as we get started today, but I hope that I've shown you an, a pattern that exists in the Bible. My prayer is that this study that we're doing here today will forever change the way you see the Bible. In other words, when you open up your Bible, do you get a sense that it really is all about this great controversy, this war that was started in heaven? It really changes the way you look at things. Okay? I think a lot of Christians go into the Bible and they take this story and they take that story and they never realize this war is going on right here and right now. If you know there's a war going on, it changes the way that you view many of these stories in the Bible. If somebody was to ask you what is the Bible about, uh, folks, I'm not saying this should be your answer, but you could certainly make the case for it being about this conspiracy 
and the war that was started in heaven that is now being carried on here on this earth. Folks, in other words, the rebellion to overthrow God's kingdom. It really is what the book is telling us about from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Now we say chapter 11 is a story about the building of the Tower of Babel. Babel. And most people know at least a little about this Old Testament story, but I want us to look at some important information that the Bible gives in all of this. Genesis chapter 11, starting with verse 1, it says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Now, this looks like it's starting in the middle of a story. It says, and, verse 1. It says, and, in verse 2. And it says, they journeyed. Who journeyed? Well, what did chapter 10 teach us about? Those, the first generations, the generations of Noah that had come off of the ark. And so that's who it's talking about here. It says that they journeyed from the east and that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and that's where they began to dwell. And verse 3, they said one to another, Go to, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. Verse 4, and they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now I'm sure most of you know this story all the way through, and how God confounded the language, languages and scattered the people abroad so that they could not finish building this tower. But did you notice what they set out to build? We call it the story of the Tower of Babel. But what did they set out to build? A city and a tower. But first it says a city. And what was the purpose of the city? What does it say? To dwell together. That's right so that they would not be scattered abroad. Well, we usually talk about the tower, but here it plainly says that they would build a city, and the purpose of a city is so that people can dwell together, right? God had told them, if you obey me, I'm going to make you a great people in the earth. If you disobey me, I'm going to scatter you abroad. So why did they build this city? They built the city to keep God from being able to scatter them abroad in the earth. That was the mentality. This was in response to what God had told them. Now that's, that's really profound. And I know that uh, they can't stop God from doing anything because God has the power, right? Amen. But we want to understand the thinking of the people. We've always known the tower was all about escaping the floodwaters, right? Never again, if, if they completed this tower and they lived in this city, God would never again be able to destroy them by a flood. But stop and think about it. Did God intend to, stop, to destroy them again by a flood? In fact, he said already before they built the tower that he would never do that. So why would you build a tower to, to keep yourself safe when God's already said, I'll keep you safe? It's all about this trust, isn't it? It's all about following a different leader and it's all about we're not going to do things God's way. We're going to do them our own way. But yet, they, want, they still want the same results, don't they? Now, I know this is just evil thinking. We all 
all know that God had already made the rainbow promise, hadn't He? That He would never again destroy the world by a flood. They didn't need to do this. But it shows the mentality of the people. They were not in danger of another flood, but what did they do? They built the tower. They were, they were in obedience to God, they would be free from ever being scattered abroad, wouldn't they? So why build a city? The whole purpose for building the city was we'll all dwell together, we won't be scattered abroad, and we don't need God's help to accomplish that. So this is the mentality. This is the whole point. Go to, let us build us a city and a tower lest we be scattered abroad. Before they built a tower, what did they build? It was a city. What was the reason for the city? Dwelling together, not being scattered abroad. Think about this. If the reason for the tower was protection from another flood, what was the reason for the city? protection from being scattered. And so who were they actually seeking protection from? Who scattered them? I mean, they're actually looking for protection from God. Very interesting. If you go down to verse 8, it says, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. So God's plan was to scatter the people throughout the earth. But why did he have that plan? What was the purpose for their scattering? Be fruitful and multiply, right? That was his... And, it, and let's face it, all the way down to our day, is it God's plan for all of his people to live together in one place does this sound like a rebellion? Does this sound like an attempt to overthrow the kingdom of God? A couple of other things here. Verse 9 says, Therefore is the name of it called Babel. The name of it would be called Babel. What is it? We always think about the tower. Everybody learns, you know, it's kind of like learning the animals going in the ark two by two. It is true, it is part of the story, but we need to get it all, right? So the name of it is called Babel. The tower was just one part. It was a great city, wasn't it? And that's very, very important. The name of the city was Babel. Now, very interesting. I believe the name of the city is Babel. I believe the name of the tower is Babel. I believe the name of the kingdom is Babel. And I believe the name of the whole rebellion, the whole conspiracy to overthrow God's government, the name of it is Babel. That's exactly right. But I want to show you something very interesting. If you look up that word Babel in the Strong's Concordance and turn to the lexicon, it's Hebrew 894, and you see it, Babel, in the, in the Hebrew phonetics, it would be Babel. Um, look at there, confusion. What does Babel mean? Confusion. Confuse the languages. But look at this. It says Babel, i.e., or a, an example of that is Babylon, including Babylonia and the Babylonian Empire, Babel, Babylon. Uh, I think the proper way to say it is Babel. That's what most people, that's how I grew up saying this. But I also think that might be Satan's way of trying to keep these two things separate in people's minds. If, if the name of the city is Babylon, then, then the shorter name should be Babel. Because it helps our minds realize 
Are they two different places? Are they two different names? And in fact, I find it fascinating that not only is it Babel or Babylon, but it's also Babylonia, which is something we learned about in history, and the Babylonian Empire, which is something we know about from history and from our study of Bible prophecies. Now, the word Babel, like it appears up top there, is only in the Bible two times. And both times, of course, it's chapter 11 of Genesis. Guess what? The word Babylon, which is the same exact Hebrew word, Hebrew 894. How many times do you think that word's used in your Bible? How about 262 more times? Times. So we can change this slide. It should actually read Babel slash Babylon because there are 264 times. The vast majority of those are Babylon. But the important part of what we learn here is there is absolutely no difference between the word Babel and the word Babylon. Okay? No difference whatsoever. They are the same word. They're the same place. All about it is the same. Just like the definition says here, the words Babel and Babylon are interchangeable. They are, in fact, the same word and the same place. Just so we completely cover the subject, there are 26 times that the Bible uses a different word for Babylon. And so Babylon actually appears in your Bible 326 times. Is that a lot of times? for a city like that, a foreign city, if you will, to be mentioned in the Bible. It's an awful lot. You could understand Jerusalem being in there a lot of times. That other word that's used is 895, and you see it really is the same thing as well. But the word Babylon appears in the New Testament too. So there's a Greek word. Is it something completely different? Babylon? Babylon? What does it say? It's, it's taken from the Hebrew word number 894, Babel, which is that Old Testament way of putting that. So I just think that's really interesting uh, when you understand that. There was a book written many years ago called the two Babylons. But that's talking about literal Babylon and spiritual Babylon. And as you go through the Bible, that's an important thing to understand about all of this. But what we want to understand at this point is that Babel and Babylon are not two different things. They're not two different words. They're actually one and the same. Now, in Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 and 9, it says this, Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. I told you that Genesis 10 was another genealogy of the first generations of the men after the flood. And here it says that Cush begat Nimrod. Do you know who Cush was? He was the eldest son of Ham. Who's Ham? Son of Noah. Youngest son of Noah. And it's interesting, Ham was the cursed son of Noah. He begat Cush, and Cush begat Nimrod, and Nimrod began to be a mighty one in the earth. And it talks about him being a hunter, and that was a big deal, obviously, back then. But if you look at the very next verse, look what it says about Nimrod. It says, And the beginning of his kingdom was what? Babel. Babel. And Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. But the important thing, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. 
So what is Babel? It's a kingdom. Is that important for our story about this conspiracy? To overthrow one kingdom, you create another one, right? The counterfeit or the replacement kingdom. So what was Nimrod besides being a mighty hunter? He was a king, wasn't he? Really, if you think about it, God told Adam in Genesis 1, 26 and 28 that he should take this earth and everything in it and God told him to have dominion over it. Who has dominion, folks? It's like a king. It's like royalty. It doesn't have to be king. There's a lot of other words we have for that. But it's as though... God appointed Adam to be the king over this earth. Now, what I believe about that is that he, if he appointed Adam to be the steward over this earth. Okay, so it's not as much like we view earthly kings, but he did have dominion over the earth and all the animals and everything that God had created. The king of kings creates a perfect world and a perfect man and gives him dominion over that world. But what does he do? What does man do? The devil tempts him and they disobey God, therefore obeying the devil. And what did that mean, folks? Did they give their dominion away? Who did they give it to? The one they obeyed, right? Really interesting. Romans 6, 16 says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you obey God, you are showing that he is your king. You are his servant. He is your master. What if we don't obey God? And in fact, we willfully obey someone else who's going completely against God. We become the servant, don't we? He becomes our master. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Folks, if the gospel is hidden, it's not hidden to those that are saved, it's hidden to those that are lost. And who are the ones that are lost, according to the Bible? Those in whom the God of this world hath blinded their minds. Amen? So, it is the God of this world. Who's the God of this world? Satan is the God of this world. Certainly not talking about the true and living God of heaven because he doesn't blind people's minds, right? Right? It's Satan, the very one that has started this war that we're talking about and who is trying to overthrow the kingdom of God. Again, Ephesians 2.2 2 says, Wherein in times past you have walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. This time it says prince. But if you look that word up in the Strong's Concordance, you know what it says? It says potentate. And when I say potentate, what do you think of? You think of a king. Well, <clears throat> you know, in my simple way of understanding, a prince would be the son of a king, right? So it's still the royal line. It's still the same principle. Who is this calling the prince? The royalty here. 
It's certainly not God because God does not work in the children of disobedience. So who is it? It's Satan himself. And now look at this next verse. This is Jesus himself talking. John 14, 30. Hereafter I will not talk much with you for the prince of this world, same word, potentate, the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. Three times in this same passage in the book of John, Jesus calls Satan the prince of this world. So why does the Bible refer to Satan as the ruler of this world? It's very simple. God created it. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but he put somebody in charge, didn't he? And what did they do? They gave their dominion away by obeying. Well, by obeying another leader is what I was about to say. But by disobeying God, that's true. <clears throat> Back to Genesis chapter 10. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. But the be beginning of the kingdom of Nimrod is this great city called Babylon. And that is still the name of this rebellion and false religious movement. And in fact, when you go into the final words of the Bible in the book of Revelation, what is that rebellion called? Revelation chapter 17 and 18. It is called Babylon the Great. And so this is the kingdom, the counterfeit kingdom of the devil himself. So I want you to think about this. The Bible is telling us the story about a rebellion that started in heaven by the highest of all the created beings there, and it shows us this rebellion through the fall of Adam and Eve and the re religious rebellion of Cain and the story of the flood and then now to the story about this kingdom called Babylon. It's mentioned a total of 264 times by that name, and I'll just tell you that there's a lot of other symbolic names that the Bible uses as well. But folks, it remi that reminds me of another important point, and that is that Babylon was a literal place. Okay? There are, as I said before, there's two Babylons. There's the literal Babel, Babel or Babylon, but there is the spiritual Babylon as well. So a lot of these references are literal when it talks about things that happened historically. But I believe that all of them refer spiritually to the false kingdom, to the counterfeit kingdom of Babylon, the spiritual Babylon, as it were. And it's really noteworthy, folks, that several of these references are in that final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, God's last day prophetic book about the end of the world. So the argument can easily be made that the subject of the rebellion and the false religious system is one of the great and main themes of the Holy Bible. Think about it. What do we start talking about in the first pages of the Bible? It's this controversy, isn't it? This, this, this war, this conspiracy. And what do you finish up talking about? The same exact thing. And that really has a lot to say about what the message, the true message of the Bible really is. And so we know that paganism and mythology began at that tower and that city called Babel, Babylon. All of the paganism that exists in our world, even today, began there. And it all comes from the same source. And really and truly what we are, we are wanting to see in all this is the pattern. Because folks, if you see religions all over the world that are not apparently connected, but they're all doing the same religious thing, what does it tell us? They have a, there has to be a common denominator. The source is the same. 
even though there's different cultures and there's different uh, languages that are involved in telling these stories, they all originate from the same source, don't they? And what source would that be? It would be Babylon, but really, even more than that, this whole thing started in heaven with Satan, right? And his rebellion. And so, it's very, very important. That is a mimeographed page out of a book, a very old book. And I just put it up there for illustration. I want to try to explain what we know about this conspiracy and how it has come to our planet. So this is just a, a layperson's explanation. But when this thing was transferred to earth and we get past those first couple of stories in our Bible, the worship began to go in a horribly wrong direction, didn't it? Where the majority of the people at the time of the flood and at those the time of the Tower of Babel and all that, were the majority of the people, were they following God's way? Were they following his true religion? So Satan sets up this false religious system, and this would be one of the earliest versions of that false religious system. But you had Nimrod, who is mentioned in the Bible, and then you have Semiramis, which was his wife. Historically, we know that that was his wife. But Semiramis, who is not mentioned by the name Semiramis, is she mentioned in the Bible? The answer is yes. And I'm going to show you that as we go through our study here. But she is named very pointedly in the Scriptures. And then there's a third person that comes into this. The child, Tammuz. Is Tammuz mentioned in the Scriptures by name? Yes. He absolutely was. We usually say it this way. Um, we're taught to think of the father, the mother, and the child, but actually in this false system of worship, the father in this story is not even the father. It's a married couple. He dies an early death, and she is left. What happens to a queen when her king is gone? She's brushed away, and another king comes and takes the throne, and you have another queen. And so, to keep that from happening, Semiramis authored this whole uh, beginning story, this beginning legend of what had taken place. Before I change this picture, I just wanted to show you what does Semiramis have on her head there? What decoration? That's a crescent moon. And what does Nimrod have above his head? A pentagram. And we recognize that these are not godly illustrations. In fact, we really don't have godly illustrations, do we? God wanted us to stay away from these things because he knew that we would be like the story in our Sabbath school this morning. We, we want to worship the thing rather than what it represents. But you see, they're mystically holding their hands and it, it would appear that the earth is levitating by their power and, and all of that. Uh, interesting that, you notice, don't miss the born on December 25th part down on the bottom. That's important too. But it becomes a trinity, a false trinity, if you will. And, you know, Nimrod was a mighty hunter. Nimrod was the first king. But really what we're talking about, we can't blame any of this on Nimrod because what he did was die. He wasn't present. But she authored this story to where he didn't really die. He just ascended to be uh, the sun god and on and on it goes. There's another representation of these three same people, except for it's a different place, so it's a different language, and they have different names. These are called Isis, Horus, and Seth. 
Another picture of Isis, Horus, and Seth. The exact same story, the exact same rituals and things, but they're brought down to a different language, a different place and all. That looks a lot like Egyptian to me, but it's actually ancient Phoenicia. And this is key because this is during the Old Testament time in our Bible. This would have been the way the story was being told at that time. And you know who these three people represent? They're up on the screen. One of them is called Baal. Baal. Another one is called Ashtoreth. And then the third one here, uh, and I'm going to look at another picture because it will make it more plainly. That third one over there is what the Bible refers to as Molech. And have you read those names in your Bible? Have you seen the name Baal a lot in your Bible? The name Asherah, the name Molech? You know, during the Old Testament times of the Bible, this is the three that God had put a lot of focus on. Later on, in Greece, they were called Kronos and Rhea and Zeus. And that's another representation of them. And you see, there's always things that need to be covered up in these pictures because they're not godly at all. This would be Rome. A little bit harder to get pictures. It's funny to me that the later period was the harder one to get pictures for. <laughs> Didn't have any pictures of them all together, but this is who we're talking about. They're known as Jupiter, Venus, and Mars. When you get down to the Greek and Roman empires, it gets a lot easier to identify these characters because if we were in secular company today and I put these pictures up here, I would say, who are these people? What would you say? They're Greek gods. Right? Right? They were used as false gods, weren't they? And you know, it goes into the other cultures of the world. It, it really does. It permeates the entire world. And this is from India. And this is, Vishnu is one of them, Brahma and Shiva. But there's many more. You know, if we did our... our Studying and we looked up the pictures and everything, we could show many, many more of these. But folks, it's all the same thing. Why are there always three of them? Why are they all always doing the same things and representing the same things? Why do the cultural way of worshiping these things seem to be so similar? This is a little chart I found online and it is a list of the different names that these three supposedly gods have in the different languages or different cultures of the world. Do any of those look familiar to you? I mean, we've talked about some of them already, but Aphrodite jumps off the list over there at me. Um, Astarte is another one. Diana is another one. Krishna. How about that? Ishtar. How about, yeah, Ishtar. That's a, that's a really good one too. How about um, Hercules? Yeah, that's not one we usually use in here, but but that's a term that everybody in the world knows about that Greek god, right? But regardless of the of the names and the places, we see a common a common bond between all of these, don't we? Another chart that I found, and these are just the names for Nimrod that you find in different places. There's so many of them. The last one on the list, Dagon. We read about Dagon in our in our Sabbath school lesson, didn't we? I have a question for you. 
if you're a Christian and you can con you can see this conspiracy that we're talking about, this rebellion to overthrow the kingdom of God, and this is all making sense to you, where would you think that the devil spends most of his time working on this project? In the church. In the church. That's exactly right. Um, is he hardest at work in a bar someplace, a, a pub someplace, or is he hardest at work in the churches of our life? He wants to be worshipped. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, which group of people does he need a most deceitful plan for overcoming them? It's the church folks, isn't it? And we could talk for hours on what he's already done in that regard, uh, but rest assured, does he have a plan for us in this church in the last day? So, is there a reason that we need to be closer to God than ever before? I'm going to stop there, and we'll we'll pick things back up next week. But uh, we need God, and no matter how much we have experienced God, we still need God. There is more. There is a greater experience to be had.